Well, good morning. It is certainly good to be with you once again. It's good to see everyone, or at least see a few, and should be with you back at home as well. We're now at the final day of May, May 31st, 2020. I will say that May, I think, went a little better than April did, but I'm kind of glad these months are moving along. We're into summer. Uh, I guess most schools or high schools are done. If they're not, they're going to be done very soon. Colleges, of course, have been done. So we're into the summer and certainly need to pray for that. But when we get to this time of year, most of the farmers have already completed their, uh, their planting, or if not, they're rapidly completing it. You with your gardens and flowers, you have probably planted most of yours. If you haven't, you will be completing them soon. And the reason we plant our gardens and our fields and so forth early is because if you don't plant, you're not gonna get a harvest. And all of us want a harvest, of course. Well, that's what we have here is that we're talking about uh, in our study that we're going to be doing here, looking at the parables of Jesus. The first one deals really with agriculture, planting seed, producing a harvest. And obviously that's not only physical, but spiritually as well. So let's go ahead and let's look at Luke chapter 8 is where we'll begin. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Luke chapter 8. That's where we're going to be looking. And... Um, Again, I certainly just take that for a moment and flip there. I'll be reading from the New International Version, the NIV. It says that while the large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came to... Came, came up, the plants withered because it had no moisture. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. I mean, that's our ultimate goal is to produce a harvest. And of course, we can talk about how we understand this and translate it. To be perfectly honest, to understand the parable shouldn't be that difficult. But Jesus actually gives us the understanding anyway, so let's take a look at it, and then we can apply it. Going to verse 11 of chapter 8. This is the meaning of the parable, Jesus says. The seed is the word of God. So we know what that is. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may believe and be saved. So they may not believe and be saved. This is the disappointment that we have as Christians when we're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Is the, this is the disappointment. But I want to focus on something else for just a second here to kind of give us an idea so we understand. Because this not only applies to spiritually talking about Christ, but it applies to other aspects of our lives. For example, in the state of Pennsylvania, according to the latest Department of Health data, um, as of Saturday morning, the coronavirus, there were over 71,000 cases in Pennsylvania. That sounds like a lot of cases, and it keeps climbing. Yet the Department of Health also reports now, they said in their news conference, that 64% of people who've had it have recovered. That's nearly two-thirds have recovered. They don't report that in a lot of papers, a lot of websites. They just total the total number of cases, the number of new ones today, and the number of deaths. They don't tell you how many have recovered, which they should, but that's not being reported. So that would mean that there are likely about 25,000 active cases in the state. However, there's an asterisk next to that because this is based upon a 30-day recovery period. Now, we all know that if you come in contact with someone who maybe did have the virus, who tested positive, or you have tested positive, you have 14 days that you are to stay at home and not leave your home. Isolation, if you will. That's where the contact tracing stuff is supposed to increase and do this and so forth. This is what they're, they're talking about. Some people at the end of that 14 days are cleared. Some, of the, some people, they're extended a little bit longer depending on their symptoms and so forth. But data now reports that actually after 11 days, you are no longer contagious after getting the virus. That's been confirmed in several places. 
So the 71,000 cases are being reported, only 25,000 are active based on the 30 day period, but if you base it upon the typical 15 day, which is what most are, you actually end up with a reality of perhaps between 12 and 13,000 active cases in the state of Pennsylvania. That certainly makes a very big difference. However, you can go through this and show data, and some of you may actually be thinking this yourself. Some will believe the 71,000 and say that, my goodness, there's more people that have it, and so therefore we have to be extremely careful and take every single precaution. We can't open too fast. Others will believe, wait a minute, it's only down to 12 or 13,000. Good heavens, it's, it's, de it's declining. The number of people are recovering is faster than the number of people achieving it. So those active cases are dropping. You know what? Let's just go on business as normal. Let's get back to it. Same data presented to both people. Different people are going to believe different things. That's the same thing with the sharing of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Some believe that the reality is that Jesus lived, he died, and he rose again to save us from our sin. I believe that. Many of you, I know, believe that. But there, okay, and there are millions more in the world that believe that. But there are also millions who do not believe this, and they believe that the reality is that Jesus lived, that he died, and he stayed dead. They could be presented with the exact same evidence, and they will come to two very different conclusions. No matter how perfectly you speak, how you present it, how you share, how you witness, how you answer their questions, and you may think, I've done a perfect job. And you know what? Some will choose to believe in Jesus, and some will choose not to believe in Jesus. And the reason being is, is that the devil will snatch away the word of God like a bird snatches away the seed before it can sprout. It's laying right there, and it could sprout, and a bird comes and snatches it away. It's laying right there in the person's heart, and boom, the devil comes and takes it away. And you can sit there and think, what do you think? Do you want to believe in Jesus? And they'll look at you, and they'll say, no. Why would I? And you're just sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, there are millions of reasons why. <laughs> and yet, they'll still reject Jesus is not blind to the reality of a sin-filled, fallen world. He understands that. Here he is as God the Son, and he is standing here, and he is presenting and teaching to the people that, you know, you're going to spread seed out, and guess what? Some people are going to just flat out reject. That's just what they're going to do. He understands this. They, many will not believe. But the seed, if you notice, is still sown. It's kind of like the idea of a farmer telling his neighbor, talking to them, saying, yeah, you know, this is really pretty bad, this field over here. See, this, it, it's a horrible field. It never produces anything. It never produces any kind of crop. It's terrible soil. It's absolutely horrendous. I know there's weeds in it, but you know what? It, just, it never could produce any kind of crop. And then the neighbor asked, well, what, what have you planted in it? I said, well, plant. Why would I plant? It's not going to produce anything, so why would I waste my seed? See, the thing is, is that we can think that as Christians, too. Why would I waste my breath on someone who's not going to believe? The problem is, if you don't plant seed, you're never going to know who won't believe, nor will you know who will believe. You've got to plant seed to produce a harvest. Jesus here is showing that the seed is going to fall upon some of those on the path who will not believe. That is very true. But you still spread the seed. You have to plant. You have to sow. If we are not spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're not going to produce a harvest. We don't know who won't believe. Our responsibility is to sow the seed, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the second path, second seed where it falls. It says, those on the rock, that's where the seed fell on rocky soil, are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Yes, the, this is, uh, the first one was disappointing. The second one here is kind of heartbreaking. 
Because there appears to be this excitement. Yes, I believe in Jesus. Oh, this is so wonderful. And you're just like, awesome. And it really pumps us up as believers. But it says they have no root, which means that they have a superficial experience of divine knowledge. In other words, they know it all up here. They're excited about the prospect of being forgiven. They're excited about the prospect of love, of knowing that they can have eternal life. And they're just pumped about this second chance and so forth. But they have not permitted it to make its way into the inmost recesses, the inner soul. They have not really adopted adopted it into their life they haven't taken a hold of it and surrendered to let god take a hold of them you know you and i we can study i can study and know all about george and martha washington uh, these are two great patriots who were hugely involved in the birth of of the united states as a nation and we certainly celebrate them and and were they perfect no they were not but they were great patriots for our nation but, you know, I can know everything that there is about them. But I do. But there are some things I will not know. Like, what would it be like to sit down and have dinner with them? I have no clue what that'd be like. What would it be like to sit down in, a, in their home and maybe a couple of rocking chairs in front of the fireplace on a cold, snowy winter night? Would I have any idea what that would be like? No. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't even recognize his or her voices if I heard them. Because I really don't know them. I know about them, but I don't really know them. Same thing here with Jesus. Someone can be very knowledgeable about all things Jesus. Can be the most world-renowned expert on all things about Jesus. Supposedly the most intelligent person on this. The most knowledgeable person. The greatest expert in this field. But knowing Him as Lord and Savior, knowing Him, having His Spirit live in you, the Holy Spirit, that is very different than knowing about Him in your mind. I mean, the devil knows the Word of God. The devil knows the, the, the Scripture, and he, he knows it, and he, under, he, he has it. <laughs> that doesn't mean he believes it. But he does have it. Temptation can come because of him, but testing comes because of God. Testing is the thing that reveals the difference between head knowledge and your innermost surrender to God, whether or not you are with him and letting go, letting him lead, or whether it's just all upstairs. Has it soaked down into your soul and your very being? See, testing comes from God. Testing is like an experiment. It's like a trial. It's, it's something to find out what, what are you like and encourages you to do what is right. Encourages you to give the right answer. Same thing with a test when you have from your teachers. They're giving you a test not so they can make you fail, even though it might feel like they're trying to torment you. But really, they want you to do what is right. Teachers take delight in seeing their students excel and do well and learn and grow. That's the point of a test. They want to see you grow and what you know. And where you didn't know, they want you to continue to learn and grow so that you will grow to know that and understand that. But the devil comes along and he tempts you. The devil in temptation, what he does is he tries to get you to lure you to do what is wrong, what is evil, what is ungodly, what is unrighteous. He gets you to tempt you to do what is all about you and not for the benefit of others nor for the glory and honor of God. He gets you to think about just yourself. He tempts you to do it because it feels good. <laughs> it doesn't end up good. There's a difference between testing from God and tempting from the devil. Tempting again to do what is evil. Testing is to do what is right. During this pandemic, this is a time of testing has occurred in our faith. And you can ask yourself several questions to see how have I done in this test? It's still ongoing, by the way. Have I trusted the Lord to be with me, to lead me through this, to protect me from it, or to heal me from it if I have it, to comfort me from the fear that I have of this, the fear of death, or perhaps to comfort me and because I am grieving because of a loss of someone I know or because of a, a loved one? Have I trusted God in this? Have, we, have I turned to Him in prayer? 
more than I have done before? Have I increased my prayer time for, for the body of believers, for the nation, for our leaders, for those who are suffering? Have I prayed more than I have before? Have I read his word, seeking answers and comfort and truth rather than just sitting in front of the TV all day long and chewing my fingernails because I'm scared to death? Have I connected with other believers to support and to encourage them and they and vice versa will do the same for me? Have I been doing that? Have I been seeking truth from God and from others? Not just going with propaganda. Have I shared my freedom in Jesus Christ with others? Encouraged others in them, their walk knowing that we will get through this. Have I shared the freedom that I have? And have I talked with others that we need to make sure we share the freedom that is in Christ so we can stand against the tyranny that tries to invade and take over? Only you know the answer to those questions. And only God knows the answers too. I can't tell you how you did. But you know. And each one of us, none of us got 100%. None of us got an A-plus perfect. Every single one of us have areas we, we did all right and areas that we need to grow in. That's what a test reveals. A test reveals where I need to grow. Verse 14, he tells us that the seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. You know, this is perhaps the most frustrating part, result from the seed, because everything looks good. Initially, it looks good. You know, you get the, you, you planted your beans or you planted your tomatoes or whatever it is. And the seed pops up and you're like, oh, everything looks great. And they continue to grow. But then after a while, you suddenly start seeing there's a difference. There's one's like this high, but the other's like this high. Why? What's the difference? Now, maybe it's not quite that much, but sometimes it is. Like, what's the difference? Why is this one stunted and this one growing really well? You're kind of like, I don't get it. When you look closer at the other, it's because the other's not getting what it needs. It's struggling because there are things competing with it. In other words, as believers, what happens is the faith, the smaller plant, if you will, the, the, the faith that has never matured, the faith is real. They know it's genuine. They believe in God. They believe in Jesus. It's real. It's genuine. But the problem is, is that they're still newborns. They've remained as newborns. Paul addresses, the writer of Hebrews addresses this, that you shouldn't be just on milk anymore. Like a newborn, you should be maturing and going to solid food, but they're not there. And why aren't there? For closer examination, typically what it shows is that believers who, who are in that position, they're not willing to remove that which uh, is hurting their faith, or the faith of their children, or the faith of their parents. The things that interfere. In other words, if they're growing and there's a weed that's right next to them, it looks really cool, but that weed is, is taking away nutrients. It's, it's something from the world. You've got to pull those weeds out. That's what we do so the plant can grow and get the nutrients, get the sunlight. But as believers, in this case, this seed, the plant that grew, the faith that was there stays stunted because they're not willing to remove the weeds. Instead, what happens is all the energy and strength goes in trying to keep the, the faith alive. And so it, it may get spindly and tall to try to reach for the light, but it's being shadowed because of all the things of the world, the worries, the fears that come in the world, or the, the pleasures of the world, or looking good, or, hey, this is a great opportunity. I cannot pass this up. Or the treasures of the world. Whatever it is, it's drawing you. And there's this weed that's growing right next to you, and you're just like, oh, yeah, well, I can grow too. It's, it's, it's like, yeah, it's okay. I can have both. And it's like you're putting feet in, in both places. You're mixing the two together. Your faith is real, but you're not growing. 
And you think, yeah, but what's the big deal? There are things in the world that are good. There's opportunities. I want to have success. I want to do well. I want to look good. I want to, hey, if I look good and people accept me, that means that I have a better opportunity for witnessing, right? Absolutely. Sure. Right. The problem here is what is the cost of you not removing those things that are interfering your faith and your children's faith? What is the cost? Jesus tells us. These people, if you notice in this verse, in this passage, that they do not mature. There's no harvest. Those are some of the most chilling words. I mean, he doesn't say it, but they're not there. There's no harvest here. Now, the previous one withered and died. The faith here is genuine, but there's no harvest. There's no reproducing themselves. So in other words, you can have one family and the couple and all the, all the brothers and sisters, they're believers in Jesus Christ. And then suddenly all the, grand, all the children and then the grandchildren turn away from God. How did that happen? Because there was no harvest. There was no legacy of faith in Christ that is passed on. Because all the energy was just maintained to try to keep the faith alive among all of the weeds that were from the world that were crowding in and choking it out. Because of an unwillingness to remove the things of the world. The lures from the world. This is where one generation can seemingly turn to God and the next one could turn away. It can happen very fast. The heartbreak here is that when that faith dies in that person, when that person dies and they go home to the eternal rewards, they are because their faith was real. There's nothing left. There's no seed left over. It's gone. There is nothing. It never reproduced itself because it couldn't mature because it was being choked by the things of the world. Let's look at Luke 8, 15 because this is the one we all want to be at. It said the, the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. This is the most wonderful kind of seed, the most joyous kind of seed that you can find because these are believers who are reproducing themselves. What I, yeah, they're having children physically, but they're having spiritual children. In other words, they are helping to lead others to Jesus Christ. Maybe they're not the ones who are saying the prayer with them. Maybe they're not the ones who actually see the decision, but they're working to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're working to help lead others to Christ and to disciple them and to bring them along so they mature and they produce a harvest. In other words, these folks are the ones who live what they preach. They live what they talk about. They walk it and they talk it. They do both of them and they choose God and Christ in all that they do willing to sacrifice the lures of the world their comforts willing to sacrifice all kinds of things because they choose God they choose to do what is beneficial to others and to choose what honors and glorifies God the two factors together doing what is wise and good listening to God and then doing as he asks because they know that they are sinners and they know the lure of the world will pull them away from God and they will choose Christ at every turn no they're not perfect but this is the desire of their heart and this is the legacy of their life we have missionaries that we support, foreign missionaries. Jane and Stephen King, if you recall them and maybe you support them, they have chosen to produce a harvest in the kingdom of God. If I remember correctly, they had horses, they had a nice house, and they've sold that because they have chosen to have less in the world so that they could produce more in the kingdom of God. And I'll tell you right now, even though they have done so, they are filled with joy, they're filled with peace, and we have seen that and have experienced it when they have visited us. And there are many other testimonies that we could show that you've chosen the kingdom of God, chosen God, chosen Christ over the world, and yet you're filled with joy and peace. You know... To the world, it seems a little weird. But I'll tell you right now, as Christians, we should be known as brothers and sisters in Christ. We ought to be known as great neighbors. Whether our neighbor is a believer or neighbor is not, it doesn't matter. We should be known as great neighbors. We should also be known as awesome, loyal, faithful, just incredible friends 
that we'll be there, we will help, and so forth. Again, it doesn't matter whether your friend's a believer or not. It doesn't matter. We should be known as great neighbors, awesome friends, who are also just a little bit different. And a little bit different means that I am willing, when I see a Lord that's coming from the world, that's growing up, to rip it out of the ground and to cast it aside and say, Lord, I choose you. Yes, I admit, that might have been a neat opportunity, but that opportunity was going to pull me away from you. It was going to pull me away from my family. It was going to pull me away from the body of believers. And you know what, Lord? I choose you. I am content with what I have. I do not need that, and I will rip it out and choose it because I will choose God. We are to be known as being a little bit different, but great neighbors and awesome friends. Look, if you want to get a good harvest, you have to be able to spread seed. And that every seed is going to produce. That's what Jesus' point. He understands the reality of the sinful and, and fallen world. He knows this. But we need to spread the word of God. We need to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be witnessing and sharing his name in our world that is being torn apart right now. Out of fear because of this virus, being torn apart because of violence in our country, because of the racial tensions and so forth. They need, we need, people need to hear about Jesus Christ. And the church has the light. We need to share it. We've got to spread the word. And we do it by just simply getting in the habits and getting comfortable with the idea of bringing Jesus into conversations intentionally. Well, how do I do that, Pastor? I don't understand how to do that. I'm confused on how to do it. It can be done simply like this. Almost everybody will greet you. Hey, man, how you doing? And all you can respond is, praise Jesus, I'm doing great. Most people will just simply, okay, hey, get good to hear. And they'll just keep walking because that's just what we do. But some will take notice. Some will say, amen, me too. Others will be like, praise Jesus? What? They'll be puzzled. You see, here's the key. We need to bring the focus back to Jesus Christ. We need to get our focus on Him. For these past weeks, it's been all about COVID-19, and the last few days, it's been all about violence. We need to get our focus back on Him, the one who can, who can help us overcome the fear of death. The one who can heal us. The one who can help us to truly love our neighbor as ourselves. The one who can heal the brokenhearted. Comfort the mourning. The one who can provide hope and peace in a world that is lacking it right now. We need to share about Jesus. Because he is the author of liberty and freedom. And there's a lot of people right now who are not enjoying freedom. Because they don't know what it is. They're stuck under tyranny of the devil right now. It's our responsibility to share, so let's do it. Let's spread some seed. And you know what? Maybe you can start practicing today. Just somewhere bring in Jesus into a conversation. Do it on purpose. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I certainly do thank you for this day. I thank you for your grace, for your mercy. I thank you for your presence, and I thank you for your parables. Your parables are great and wonderful. They're challenging, but they also deal with the real world. I pray that you would help us all to spread seed. We know that not all seed is going to produce a harvest. We, we, we understand that, and you do too. But I pray we would not hesitate to spread seed. We have to. We have to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about you. I know there's going to be some fears, some nervousness, and, uh, and, and almost jittery, and you're kind of like, oh, I don't know how to do this. And Lord, give us your peace. Give us your strength. And through your grace, I pray that we would speak your name. And we would do so with love, but would also with courage. Help us, Lord, to grow and be faithful evangelists, ambassadors, so that we can lead others 
to you and produce a harvest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.